This is tooth five. How far did I hang the cutter out of the fly cutter such that the cutter was approximately the diameter of this or a little bit smaller? And when you're using a fly cutter, of course, all of the cutting is done on one tooth rather than on a, a dozen or more teeth like we have here. So this would be much easier cutting. This will be the sixth and final tooth. Now if I would have had a V-block that was longer than the one that's in the vise that would have come up like this and supported it, that would have been even better because naturally there's going to be some vibration here, even in half inch stock. And it would be a worse problem if the work was smaller diameter. Notice that uh, I do have a little room here yet, but that would be the limiting factor on how many teeth you could cut, as well as how much shank I have here. And there wasn't a whole lot of extra shank there, so in my estimation I'm holding it rather precariously as is. Rigidity is what it's all about, and it's, it's really tough to get a, a setup like this that is rigid enough, at least for my uh, standards. All right, here's the last tooth. If you encounter strange noises or a change in the frequency or the, uh, the amount of noise as you uh, continue here on any kind of project, stop immediately, investigate, and see what the matter is. Because usually if the, uh, if the uh, sound changes, it's either that something has gotten loose, the tool or the work, or you've lost the edge on the tool. Now I'm ready to take the work out, but examine your work carefully and uh, think about it before you remove your work from your vise because you're not going to get it back in there the same. It just isn't going to happen. So uh, you want to make sure that you're truly done and don't need to go back and make any little uh, adjustments or second cuts or anything of that nature. So let's take it out now and uh, I'm going to go over to the bench and deburr. There isn't a whole lot of burrs but there'll be some burrs. And then remember I got a hole to drill in each end and I'm going to face off this top end so that I end up with a portion of a tooth like the original had. And then I have to cut the stock off so the overall length is the same as this piece. And of course when I drill the one hole I'm going to install a pin in there. This one was turned down you can see but I'm going to make it as two pieces. Make it easy on yourself, not difficult. I interrupt this video to take a 60 second mini shop tour here just to show you a few things of where rack and pinions are used in just every shop. So under the bed of every lathe, of course, there is a rack mounted, usually right above the lead screw. And 
when we turn the uh, hand wheel there's a pinion or a series of gears and a pinion that then rides on the rack and moves the carriage back and forth. Every drill press employs a rack and pinion. This little mini one here is a, is a little bit different uh, than, than what you're normally going to see, but there's the rack and pinion on there and of, of uh, all manual type arbor presses, our rack and pinion. And every drill press, here's another drill press, including the quill on the bridge port uses a rack and pinion. So there's a lot of applications for that. And uh, everyone that drives a front wheel car is using a rack and pinion every time they get in. There are probably a lot of other things to see here in the shop too, but those are just little ones that come to mind. Now back to the business at hand. As I just adjusted my tripod, it uh, came to mind that I was adjusting a rack and pinion for the height. And I also forgot to mention that on every dial caliper there's a tiny little rack right there. And the pinion, of course, is the gear on the end of the dial. Now back to the business at hand. Okay, it's looking mighty good. Here's the original. A few more tool marks on mine than there is on the original, but no problem. And I still have to cut this to length, but let's put it in the fixture here now. I did deburr it. There were, there were not a lot of burrs on it, but when we put it into the... Uh, actual part here, You can see it's going to work just fine. There's a relatively short stroke here of approximately a half inch and that's all that's needed. Over to the lathe. I will now face off the last tooth here so I have uh, just what looks like about a, a half of a tooth here. So that's this operation. is face down to the correct length. <clears throat> now there's a hole here in the original piece and the purpose of that of course is for the spring. So that's a 3 16 hole and uh, notice the little uh, red mark I have on the on the drill bit. I, I know it seems amateurish but I like to do that because that's accurate enough for the, the depth of a hole to hold a spring and I've already center drilled it so I'm ready to drill. I'm getting close to the end, although it's a long video. Well, this is the original, broken off, and it was meant to fit into these indexing holes. And the size of those holes, this is a drill bit, fits in just nice, but not too tight. I don't want it to where I have to force it in. And that bit is 964. Often I use drill bits as, as gauges. So that's, uh, that's the drill bit size. Now I've already faced this off to the correct length. I'm going to put it back in the lathe, center drill it, and drill it this size. Well, I'll go a half inch deep, it doesn't really matter. But this drill, and it's a brand new one, is going to be sacrificed and it itself will be the pin. So I will uh, use thread lock or uh, Loctite, put that into the hole, and then I will determine the length, cut it off, 
chamfer a little bit and the job will be done. It is extremely important that this hole be concentric with the, the workpiece so I already uh, used this starter bit to establish the hole and here's the drill bit with a red mark on it. I'm going to drill up to the line which is about 5 eighths deep and then we're done on the lathe. eliminates all the need to uh, harden this piece as far as I'm concerned which would be one more step in the possibility of it cracking all right I'll take it out degrease it chamfer that hole countersink that hole ever so slightly and the piece is ready to be held in with Loctite I've cleaned the hole out with degreaser and well why are you using a good drill bit you're thinking well because where else are you going to find a piece of material without turning it down that is uh, 964 in diameter well a drill bit's the perfect size and now you go to the hardware store anything that you might find and you won't find that pin that size is going to be a dollar anyway or usually seven dollars everything at my hardware store is seven dollars so we'll use a little uh, Loctite. Now you don't want too much or as you force it in there uh, it, there's an airlock sometimes and it pushes it back out. So just make sure there's plenty on there. Now if it's in uh, the wrong spot or you ever have to take it out it's easy enough just to warm it up real nicely. You don't have to get it all that hot and uh, you can take the part out. Now I don't know how long the pin needs to be at this time so that's why I'm putting the whole drill bit in there and I will after this sets up I'm going to go have lunch come back in an hour and uh, determine how long it needs to be cut it off and uh, bevel it a little bit and hopefully the work is done and you say well the shank on a drill bit is not as hard as the cutting end and that's true. The shanks are fairly hard but not all that hard but certainly that's still a piece of uh, tool steel and that's going to work quite nicely for that pin. Can it be broken off? Yes. You know a hammer and chisel mechanic can break anything off. One hour's time has passed and the Loctite has set up. Now I took the Dremel, actually it's a little Ryobi with a Dremel type abrasive cutter, cutter. <clears throat> cut the drill bit off and no I don't save pieces like that and you shouldn't either did you hear it hit the wastebasket I know it's high speed steel okay and then I rounded this off a little bit so I wouldn't cut myself mounted it uh, in here and then over on the dividing head so that I could uh, determine what the length should be because remember this is broken off. I don't know how long it was from the factory. So I got that marked. I'll step over to the vise, grind that off, chamfer it, and then we'll go on over to the dividing head and see how this fits up. And I know it will. I hope. And there it is. Pretty good match. Again, here's the kind of tool you have to grind for a little rack. Not much to it. Almost looks like an Acme threading tool. And I think pretty forgiving to produce this. Every time I look at this thing uh, a little closer, I'm more impressed at the quality. 
This surface here has been hand scraped as has been this mating surface here and keyed and serial numbered and one two places I suppose to match the pieces when they're fitting them up in the factory. Now this is quite a stiff spring. Now I'll put a little oil on this in final assembly. Not yet, so it's messy. I dropped the spring. Luckily it didn't disappear. You know, springs have a way of disappearing when they hit the floor. Have you noticed that? Sometimes don't even bother looking for them. Just go to the hardware store. In it goes. And that was the final length on that pin. About 3 16 sticking out. Not much. And then I've got to time this correctly here so that it moves the way I want it to. So let me oil it now. I'll put a little oil here and I'm going to put it into position. In order to use this direct indexing, of course, I've got the worm disengaged so that this crank isn't doing a blame thing. And I think I've got this thing mounted the way I want it. And by loosening this up, you can see that, oops, I dropped an oil screw. screw. <clears throat> see how that operates? And then to hold it back, you just tighten this little uh, neural knob. That's a very tight spring. Very tight. Another thing I just noticed here is that there's two screws up here, and I took one out. That's the one I just dropped, and it says oil, oil. I just now noticed those, and this hole is about two inches deep, so I'm not sure what that oils. I'll have to figure that out. Another thing I'm not sure of is what these holes are for. And there are numbers on some of them, so I thought it was part of the index operation. But maybe it's just for a spanner wrench to turn this as you index. But it's a little handier just to use a punch or something round like that. And that doesn't quite fit. Yeah, it fits. So let's move in and see how it index. I have tightened this nut so that uh, the plunger attachment here is uh, aligned with the 36 uh, circle hole. That's the outer hole. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, I always forget which way this goes. Back it out. Release it. Now listen to it as it clicks into the next hole click and then the cut could be made. When that cut's complete, back the pin off, move up to the next hole, make the next cut, and so on. Looking at it from this angle, I have now aligned the plunger with the center set of holes, which is the 30 hole ring, and similar movement here. Click. Perform your operation. Move it. Click. Perform the operation. Perform the operation. Make the cut. And so on. Pretty slick. You know, uh, one thing I didn't mention is pretty darn important that uh, when you make each cut that you take just a minute to lock this then if there is any little bit of backlash, uh, that would eliminate it so that the spindle could not turn. But it's one more step that you'd have to perform. And a lot of people forget to unlock it, and then uh, that causes wear. Now a word of caution and a reminder that when you're done with your direct milling, your direct indexing, you should disengage the pin Tighten this, but in fact, I told you that spring is so strong that I think 
a plier should be used to snug it up. Either that or I should replace the spring with one that isn't quite that strong. Now when I re-engage the worm, and turn this around, and give it a good crank here, I am not going to break off the pin because I'm sure that's what happened to start with is that someone had the pin engaged and you have a great deal of mechanical advantage here 40 to 1 if you want to know the truth and that's I'm sure what broke it off and caused the whole project here and uh, that's it Remember that a long rack has to be cut on a horizontal mill. It just isn't within the capabilities of a bridge port, but uh, this worked just fine for this short gear rack, and I uh, hope you can use this information. And this concludes this little video on cutting a rack. Now stay tuned for other videos that will be available on cutting gears on the bridge port mill of various kinds. Remember, this is a long series on gear cutting possibly eight to ten chapters altogether. This is Tubal Cain saying so long for now.